Thanks for tuning in with us. I'm excited to dig into the book of Mark, and I'm glad that you guys could join us. I'm also here with my professor and pastor, Sasha, and my good friend and brother, John. And we're going to be studying lesson six, entitled Inside Out. And pastor, I'm just so curious. When we get to Mark chapter seven, verse seven through eight, Jesus is showing the problem between the traditions of man and the commandments of God and how people are inclined to follow the traditions of men. What did he mean when he mentions the washing of cups and pitchers? What was this tradition that he was referring to? Yeah, that's very important uh, information. Sometimes, uh, to be honest with you guys, some people criticize me that I uh, use uh, Judaism to interpret uh, the Gospels. Mm. But what else can we do right here? Just take a look at uh, uh, Mark chapter uh, 7. Let's just read verses 1 through uh, uh, 5. <clears throat> the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves, and there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? So, impure unwashed hands, right? Mm. Mm. Uh, well, back in those days... There was uh, no uh, medicine, uh, no knowledge of uh, hygiene, mm. right? Germ theory, yeah. Germ theory, right? So maybe these elders were not too bad by telling people to wash their hands before eating food. Uh, so why did why Jesus says don't don't wash the hands before eating any food? Yeah. Do you see where I'm leading you? Hmm. I'm leading you to a trap. Hmm. Because if we look at the situation, you know, think mm -hmm. about this at face value. Yeah, from at what the face value today's uh, you know, uh, American or anybody from a civilized uh, world knows, especially after the COVID, <laughs> mm, mm -hmm. that you better wash your hands. That's true. So, and if we don't dig deeper, we're going to think, what is Jesus teaching? Why is mm. he yeah. so obsessed and starts criticizing the Pharisees for fairly reasonable hygienic group, hygienic uh, practice. practice. Yeah. So you're saying this was not about hygiene. Correct. Uh, mm -hmm. What was this tradition of the elders then? Exactly. That's what the issue here. So let's pay attention how Mark is important here. Let's read verse three again. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. Yes, so that's important. What we have, uh, you know, as any Jew who knows a little bit about Judaism will immediately recognize what tradition of the elders mean. Because uh, in Judaism, it's taught that Moses gave to the people the Torah, which is basically the Pentateuch from Genesis to Deuteronomy, and that is called the written Torah. Mm. But they also teach that there is an oral Torah, hmm. which is basically the tradition of the elders. Wow. So uh, that. The gospel here is speaking into the historical context of Judaism. So 
back in the first century BC AD, you know, this tradition of the elders was uh, developed. Uh, well, I, I, I will admit, you know, I'll just mention that, uh, of course, uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, Jews began to teach that the oral Torah came from the Mount Sinai through Moses, you know, in other words, Moses got something which he wrote and then he spoke additionally and that, that's why all of this. But we don't have the, uh, any attestation of this at this time, but the tradition of the elders, mm, that was uh, something uh, which uh, existed, I would say, Hmm. Uh, and uh, what the tradition of the elders is, um, you know, sometimes we're often too stereotypically negative about this. But in reality, uh, do we have today in a Seventh-day Adventist <laughs> church any traditions which we follow? Yes, and, and they are... You know, I would say oral Torah equivalent in in the sense that they're not part of our doctrinal beliefs. There, there, there are just things that we do that are outside of what is written. Mm. Uh, for example, now well, let me think of this: How often do we do Lord's Supper? Oh, okay. Mm, it so varies. It varies, correct? But traditionally. Once a quarter. Exactly. Mm. Paul says, as often as you remember the death of Jesus. But how often? Doesn't say. Doesn't say. Mm. So, like, how do we, how, for example, elders, right? How do elders, uh, you know, come, you know, do I, can I, as a pastor, come in and say, to the in front of the church this is your elder and this is your church clerk there's a business meeting there's a democratic process mm. we have a church manual that church dictates manual. policy correct church manual what is the church manual de facto it's a church it's let's call it scientifically ecclesiological tradition mm. developed by the church yes. so it's a tradition which we all agreed it's nice so that we would have a nice democratic process without anybody trying to hijack the power so in other words you're saying the oral tradition or the tradition of the elders wasn't in essence evil or bad the problem jesus had with it was basically that it was being put over god's word yes some of the traditions are biblically based and some are not. Mm. And that's, you know, Jesus uh, didn't mind biblically based tradition. For example, uh, Passover, not the sacrificial part of it, but the remembrance of the exodus from Egypt. Mm. You know, it says you have to teach your children about the miracles and wonders. Mm. And all this has to be remembered throughout the generation. Is it? That's, that's what the Bible says. Makes sense to today? Yeah. 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 But how to do it? It wasn't written. So tradition developed how to do it. And Jesus uses it. Mm. Because at the Passover uh, supper, uh, or, or, yeah, they uh, basically eat bread and wine. Mm. And Jesus did the same. Yeah. Right. Where and, scripture says there is unleavened bread, it doesn't say anything about the wine. Exactly. That's a, one of the proofs, and there are many more proofs that Jesus didn't mind mm. some of the traditions of the elder, but not some others. Because what I have here to show you, uh, this is, you know, Mishnah Yot or Mishnah. Mishnah is basically a Codex with the recorded traditions of the Pharisees, to make it simplified, oh. they were recorded in the second century. So pretty close to, you know, because during the time of Jesus, they were all oral, but then they were put in writing. And so there are different topics and tractates in there. And what we're talking here is right there. So uh, I'm going to show you here. Uh, this is tractate known as Yadai means hands. 
Hmm. And the whole thing here is how to cleanse hands. It's not about hygiene. Oh. It's about something defiles hands. So it's a, it's a ritual uh, ceremonial washing? Actually, there is no ceremonial washing in the Torah that involves hands. Interesting. During our previous lesson, we discussed somebody touches unclean person in the state of ritual uncleanness. Uh, he needs to wash his whole body mm -hmm. and clothes. The hands are not mentioned. The hands are being washed. The main principle here is you come into the contact with a non-Jew and you are defiled by this outside influence, which is evil. And that's not a biblical principle, is it? No. Oh. I mean, it's, it's crazy a little bit because initial intent mm. wasn't bad. Mm. You know what Nehemiah and Ezra faced? They yeah. faced... Remember this marriages? Intermarrying with pagans and, and people from mm -hmm. the areas of Assyria. Do not allow yourself to be influenced by So them. the foreign wives were put away. Yeah, they had to do it because their children even didn't speak any Hebrew. Wow. It, was, uh, it was a threat to the society. But you see, something like this is just such an overreaction. Uh, they took it too far. Yeah, that's the problem. And Jesus is fighting guys he says what are you doing you're trying to protect jewish society from pagan influence but you went so far that you've forgotten the commandment of god so don't do this that's why he stood up for this because there was just a nonsense coming from the marketplace uh you know paying money to some uh you know let's say greek uh, uh merchant uh, to buy some you know, let's say, uh, some dishes, you bring it home, oh, it's unclean, you need to cleanse it because it's foreign. It's, it's, so they were basically washing their hands because a non-Jew touched it. Yes. This is, this is incredible. So That's so non-biblical. This literally clarifies the rest of the verses because you find that by the time we get to verse 18 of Mark chapter 7, right, and you go onward, in verse 19, I'll read it. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. So when he says purifying all foods, he's not talking about abolishing the dietary laws at all, but it's in the context of what you just told us? Correct. Wow. So he's talking about the defiling. So... Yeah. So let's imagine that I am a Jew and I buy food from a Gentile. That, that's what he's talking about here. It's not, it's not impure because it came from a Gentile source. Yeah. yeah, it is impure for them because it came from a Gentile source and they're very careful. Like I tell you example, one day in Tel Aviv, uh, the group of Orthodox Jews wanted to have a debate with us. Yeah. So we treated them nicely, and my wife offered them peaches. Do you think peaches are unclean food? No. No, no not at all. But they said, we're not going to touch it. Really? Because, you know why? Wow. why? They said, because we don't trust that you follow our laws, we don't know if these peaches come from some grove which belonged to Arabs and they might have, uh, 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 may have, might have harvested them in, in the sabbatical year. Wow. Think about it. So even though you were Jewish, it was, it was not enough. Yeah, I wasn't enough Jewish for them because <laughs> I wasn't enough Orthodox. I wasn't, teach, I wasn't following the teaching of their rabbi. So this is the mindset that's happening in Mark chapter 7 that exactly. Jesus is combating, which this is extremely valuable for our viewers to understand. Because a lot of times we read scripture with an American understanding, mm -hmm. and it really glosses over the beauty of what is happening here. Jesus was fighting prejudice. He was fighting serious prejudice. So my question now is, if the foods here 
that Jesus is talking about saying, thus purifying all foods, he's really connecting it to the prejudice that the Jews had regarding the Gentiles, then there must be a correlation to the next verses when Jesus starts talking and showing the faith of a Gentile woman. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Oh, yeah. This is very well connected. I like that you connected it, Libni. So why does he call her a dog? Mm. Does it have to do with what you just mentioned about how the Jews perceive the Gentiles as unclean? Mm. And And also how they perceive dogs in their culture is is highly negative, is it not? Uh, So do you remember about the dogs? Um, Like, um, um, I'm not sure if you... Be, if you be, listen to those news back then in mm-hmm. uh, oh, oh 04, oh 03, that's Iraq war. Mm-hmm. And uh, when the uh, debate over whether or not to use the dogs in interrogation of Arabs. Right, right, yes. right. I didn't hear about it, but I remember you saying this in a previous lesson. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it, they, they just revile dogs to such a degree. It'd be, I think you said, like dangling a rat mm-hmm. in front of mm-hmm. someone's face. Oh, man. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for reminding me that. I won't repeat myself then. Uh, But um, there is a little bit of a different story. So uh, you have this uh, story of uh, of this woman. So uh, let's let's read it. Uh, uh, Mark 7, uh, verse 24, uh, through... uh, 27. <clears throat> Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race. And she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, Let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. So this is kind of a very interesting. Uh, sometimes we need to, f- to fill the whole puzzle. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need both sides of the puzzle. So I, I have to... Uh, go to the Gospel of Matthew, uh, because besides this story, this uh, epithets about dogs, uh, there is one more thing which uh, Jesus says, and Matthew records it, uh, Matthew 15, uh, 24. <clears throat> Matthew fifteen twenty four says, But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So, so that's what he's talking about when he says children. Mm-hmm. So his mission is to be sent for the lost sheep of the uh, children of Israel. Uh, and especially it's talking about the casting out demons. What we discussed in the last lesson, right in the previous lesson, we discussed how Jews were attacked by Satan and there were so many victims of satanic attacks among the Jews. Well, think about this. So you, Libni, talk to me a lot about some, you know, like even the situation in Haiti because it's so so hopeless. Uh, Why? Repeat what you were usually saying to me. Well, you know, I have a lot of family from Haiti. And the whole nation has been basically sold to the powers of the devil because of their customary religion, which is voodoo. And voodoo is so entrenched in the culture, everything they do, everything that the nation does revolves around the satanic spiritualism. And so the whole nation is sold under the power of Satan. Isn't it also in their constitution? And it's even in the constitution. The lore behind the constitution was the same thing. that it was. So, in your observations... Um, do you s- think that there are some voodoo worshippers who are definitely demon possessed? Absolutely. In fact, like I have heard first hand accounts of it. Okay. For sure. So let's say you want to cast out a demon 
from someone who is a hardcore voodoo worshiper. Mm. What's going to happen? Mm. It's, it's going to happen again. It's going to go right back to the way it was because they are, you, you would be treating the symptom rather than the disease. Mm. Correct. Wow. Yeah. That's a good way of saying it. In other words, what's the point of even doing it wow. if the core issue is not addressed? Wow. So like this uh, Syro uh, you know, Phoenician woman comes in and you know, it's well known and documented that these cults were very, very satanic. Hmm. And yeah, maybe this woman, uh, maybe this gal, the daughter, was uh, possessed by a demon. But what's the point of Jesus doing that wow. to someone who is entrenched in this pagan cult. Mm. This makes so much sense. And, and maybe this woman who is, who is beseeching Jesus, maybe she would have the sense to, you know, not continue in those practices, but it's not even her, it's her daughter. Does she have full control of what her daughter does, you know? Take a look at Matthew. Mm. What, when Jesus says, I'm coming to... Uh, this lost sheep of Israel. And in Mark chapter 1, what happens? Uh, Jesus' first thing, the very first miracle, we already talked about this, yeah. is with casting out the demon from somebody who, were th who was the where? In the synagogue. Yeah. So this guy was wanted to be in the synagogue. He wanted to worship yeah. God, but he made a mistake and he was a victim of demon. Wow. So it's like what Jesus is trying to gauge here is, are you a victim or you are a willing participant wow. who just discovered that, sorry, it's painful? Hmm. You know what so, I mean? So you're not, you, you don't regret your choice. You only regret the consequences. That's it's, right. He's trying to figure out it's which is It's like somebody on drugs comes in and says, I feel so bad, I am in pain, and so forth. Overdosing, right? Okay, the hospital saved him for how long mm -hmm. before he goes comes and back. does it again? Uh, yeah, I the see it all the time. The issue of addiction isn't addressed. So the way that Jesus gauges whether she's a willing participant or a victim or her daughter, is that he uses this harsh language that the Jews were used to calling the Greeks, which were dogs. And I'm guessing her response is what clarified that she actually wanted to be made well, or her daughter, and that she was a victim, right? Yeah. Take a look what Matthew says. Um, there is a, more details here in this gospel. <laughs> in and which verse? Let's read verse 25 through 28. <clears throat> but she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. So by determining from her answers, maybe her answers seem to be a bit strange because remember, they're talking the language of their culture, you know, yeah. some of the things even, uh, let's say, even in the 19th century, uh, when people were talking one way, uh, cannot be talked anymore today. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, some, mm. some words today. Uh, in the 19th century, it was a norm, but today it's a racial slur. Yeah. Exactly. And so this is uh, this is the same wow. this is the same type when we we see this dog and you know crumbs and stuff like this you know this is 
That's, that's the language they talked. But the result is very clear. Jesus, through this conversation, Jesus determined that this woman had faith. Amen. She is not going to go back to her voodoo-style cult, hmm. and she is a changed person. So, yes, a hmm. demon need to come out because that's going to be an obstacle. She's not going to go back. Something else that I perceive here, it seems to me as though through her, through her turn of phrase, she's, she's effectively saying, the blessing that you bring is so abundant that crumbs are enough for me. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. That's, that's so powerful. Yeah, this is, this is exactly right. She said, I'll be enough. I, I'm glad you made this observation. It's like, I'll be even enough. It will be enough for, even for me to get a crumbs. And when she says it to Jesus, that's indication. Oh, she has a faith. Wow. And usually, okay, you des you definitely, uh, uh, you definitely need to have a full loaf of bread because you have this faith. You, you are no longer wanting to be that kind of a part of a pagan cult. This is true conversion. Yes. This is true because he says her faith is great. Yes. This, yes. Is, this is amazing because now I'm starting to see a theme here. Everything that you're saying is connecting these stories in such a, a great way because what we're noticing is we have the lady bleeding for 12 years and she touches the tassels from our last lesson. And just the, the, the corner of his garments. We have this lady who's just satisfied with a little bit, you know, of crumbs. You have even in Mark, you find uh, the two mites that later we're gonna be talking about. And so these are people who were ostracized and they were seeing something in Jesus that was extremely valuable that could remedy their condition. Uh, when we started talking about the issue of uh, washing, ritual washing yeah. of the hands, or better to say ritual cleansing of the hands, and uh, by the way, it's, it's interesting today in Orthodox Judaism, especially Hasidic Jews, you know, when you go to Israel, for example, any restaurant, you go to the bathroom, you know, to wash the hands. So you see a normal faucet, and then you see um, a, a special cup, which is sitting on a, on the, with, together with, you know, besides the faucet, you know, or tied to a chain, whatever. So you, you, if you can observe, what you're going to see is this. So here comes a tourist. Wash the hands, soap, go home. Go sit at the table. Then comes an Orthodox Jew. So he takes, he does the same thing. He takes the soap, washes the hands like all people do. Then he says, he takes the cup, fills it with the water, and starts pouring on the tips of his finger and saying a special, uh, reciting a special blessing. Uh, which is definitely a ritual, and the roots of this ritual is in the principle which um, the rabbis, uh, um, you know, instituted. And this principle is that uh, uh, Peter understood it later in the book of Acts uh, yes. when he came to Cornelius and says, I realize there is nobody unclean. Wow. But think about this. Uh, when we talk about the traditions, many of the traditions are designed to guard the law. Yeah. For example, remember, thou shalt not commit adultery in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus takes it where? Mm, takes it deeper. If you even look with lust at a woman. Yeah. Begins in the heart. That's the, that's the fence around the law. That's ethical fence. I mean, what, how do we apply it? I mean, you know, anytime some thoughts visited your mind, you already a violator of the seventh commandment. Do you believe that, you know, like every man's bottle, we're lost all because sometimes? I think it speaks to our sinful nature that it is inherent to us. I don't know that it's necessarily you know, you commit the sin of adultery in the literal sense. Mm. It, these are the guardrails. For example, as a pastor, 
my guardrails is this, at least what they did, very good. The office has a glass Window. door. So if I'm speaking, you know, to the woman privately, it's not behind the closed door and nobody mm. sees it. You have nothing to hide. Yeah. Yes. So there are certain things which you do to guard yourself from making another step which can lead you to yeah. a problem. So these were guardrails. They just took it too far. They took it. They, they, they had a different priorities. Mm. Like, do not be equally yoked, unequally yoked with somebody who is not uh, your faith, right? Yeah. So it's a, it's a good principle. Very good principle. Very good principle. Very, very. But don't make out of it like anybody who is not an Adventist, if you shake his hand, you are unclean. Uh, hmm. That was what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, this makes so much sense because this is why Jesus in Mark chapter 7, 18, he emphasizes that defilement isn't by all these external things but it's from what the heart is and yeah. where the heart posture is. Yeah, yeah, it's like, like and, and the same thing with the, the, with the, you know, we have to, uh, we have, Jesus teaches in these two uh, stories, Jesus teaches us <laughs> not how to eat pork, but how to treat non-Jews, or in our case, how to treat people of a different faith. Guys, honestly, this has been amazing. And this is how we should be studying the Bible. So I'm so glad that you guys were able to join us. Please stay tuned. Make sure to like and subscribe and share with your friends as we continue studying the book of Mark.